Welcome to the Fright Lab. I'm Lucas Yoakum. And with us today is a man who knows when to just let the camera keep rolling, Mr. Joseph Wren. Joe, are you ready for this? I have never been one to turn off the camera or the recorder. I want to hear it all. I want to see it all. I want to go back and say, that happened. There's value in being a documentarian. Good evening, all of you gruesome people, and welcome to the Fried Lab. I'm glad you used the word documentarian. That's going to come up later. Just set that right up for you so you can (laughs) knock that pin down. You'll see in a bit. This is an episode uh, that I've been wanting to do for a while. Um, This is the first episode of a series that I've honestly been thinking about before I started writing the Fright Lab. As some of you know, I have a long-standing interest in the way genres work and how they apply parameters to make things work. I've mentioned before that I used to write for a small and sadly now defunct horror review site, and it was my main contribution there that I was writing a long-form analysis of folk horror. And in some alternate universe, there's still a Lucas still writing there, working on further genre analysis. Specifically, I had planned on trying to wade into the waters of found footage horror, and at the time, I realized it was just too deep of a subject and the boundaries of it were just kind of too nebulous to really pull it off in just a written format. And since we started releasing episodes back in October of 2022, uh, it is now my, my view of the genre that has kind of changed some. I've realized that discussing found footage horror in any conventional sense of film analysis just fails for me. And that's not because these movies can't be discussed in terms of like technical merits or flaws, uh, nor is it a matter of found footage having a set of existing norms or tropes or not. Like, I think that's fairly well established that they do. It definitely does. Yeah. Instead, I'm going to put forth a handful of hypotheses and a attempt to then discuss them on their own. Consider what I'm going to propose throughout these next few episodes as like a working theory. And like all theories, I could be wrong about this. I'm willing to alter my ideas uh, according to changes in the details that I discover. This is the Fright Lab, not the Fright Pulpit, you know? (laughs) So to start this series, the the basis of my theory. Let's try to outline that here. Found footage horror is not really a genre. The specific term, found footage horror, is actually a description of some filmmaking methods and devices, a set of conceits, if you will, to explain why a number of plot mechanics and aesthetic decisions are made. And I want to put forward my own term of how we're going to describe this system going forward. Horror cinema verite. This will require us to uh, fall into the weeds of some like traditional film theory, if only briefly, but I promise not to weigh us down too much with that sort of info before we start talking about the fun stuff. So, before we can turn on that old blood spigot for horror, what is cinema verite really? So the term emerges from a French filmmaker, Jean Roche, uh, emerging in the 1960s. This was a method of filmmaking that has some basic rules. For instance, the film is not supposed to have voiceover or subtitles. If you are walking down the street and you hear someone speaking a language you don't know, uh, unless you're wearing like AR glasses, you aren't going to see that language translated for you. So if there's no voiceover in real life, there can't be any in cinema verite. Now, there is also a concept in Cinema Verite of the filmmaker not really being involved in the film. They're supposed to be more of an observer, and that's hard to do in what we think of as found footage horror, but ultimately, the person operating the camera tends to end up being way less important than the people in front of the lens. Finally, the concept of cinema being truthful. Um, I argue that what we think of as found footage uh, as attempting to show people reacting more normally or realistically in horrible situations. Well, is that even possible? I think so, but I imagine that it's a pretty deep subject to discuss. 
you know, email us at the fright lab podcast at gmail.com to let us know what you think. If you have a background in psychology or maybe just traditional film theory, uh, we want to know. Uh, we're also going to include a good short description of cinema verite in the show notes. If you want to further understand the basics. So now we have to understand what is horror cinema verite. What are the concepts that create it out of just original basic cinema verite, right? My working theory here has a handful of ideas. To start, a scary thing either needs to be happening or is about to happen. And in either case, someone or some group needs to be recording, filming, etc. this event for reasons that aren't typically about making horror media, though it's possible that those sorts of meta commentaries can exist. Uh, there also like, kind of needs to be the actual production of the film that's discussed, and this is maybe the most obvious thing. The actual production of the film needs to follow the technology of the era that it's created in. So if you have a horror cinema verite whose plot is set in like 1995, it makes more sense if it's filmed on period correct cameras and recording stock. I feel that these basic ideas are a pretty decent place to start. But like anything involving art, it's it just can't be that simple, right? We need to discuss the changes that have occurred in horror trends first. For a lot of people, the most emblematic pieces of found footage horror are paranormal activity, at least the first one or two, and the Blair Witch Project. And don't worry, we will talk about them in slightly more depth soon. But what separates paranormal activity from like Lake Mungo or Grave Encounters. Hell, for that matter, what's the difference between Lake Mungo and Grave Encounters? Sure, they've all been called found footage, but they don't really have anything in common when you get right down to it. So we need to create a certain amount of nomenclature to describe these differences. In many regards, these films uh, represent like generations or different iterations of the concept of horror cinema verite. After doing minutes upon minutes of research and introspection, I think we can describe these iterations as follows. The first generation or iteration is what I consider actual found footage horror. The basic premise is that the events of the horror movie proper are being filmed as they happen. Further, the films are either said to have been discovered somewhere or are implied to have been discovered. We're just going to stick with the term found footage with this type. It's just the easiest. The next iteration or generation could be described as mockumentary. Now, mockumentaries have existed for a long time. Joe, uh, fans of discography discussion are no doubt familiar with This is Spinal Tap, right? One of the greatest films of all time. If the scale of rating for your particular website does not include 11 as an option you're not doing it right, because you could just make 10 higher, but these go to 11. Spinal Tap, it's one of the great films of all time. It's not just a good comedy film, but it's an example of what it takes to make an original entertaining film. The cast has to go all in. Even if you have to come up with a backstory that is so absurd, you can't stop there. You have to write songs about your band you know now you got to play them on stage mm. take the funny to the limit that is going to be one of the how do you make your mockumentary or your found footage thing work you have to actually do the thing that you're saying is happening on the screen Look, I like this as Spinal Tap as much as the next guy, but I am 100% convinced that Stanley Kubrick would be spinning in his fucking grave if he heard that. <laughs> One of the best movies. You should you should be ashamed of yourself, sir. You really should. <laughs> I am not ashamed. I'd watch that film right now if it was available. Fair enough. So, uh, with horror mockumentaries, the conceit is pretty straightforward. You are watching a fake documentary film about a scary subject or a subject that somehow turns scary. Got it. Okay, so then the third generation. The third generation or iteration of this is the faux ghost hunting show. I'm guessing that most of you are already aware of this idea of ghost hunting shows. Uh, that particular bit of reality television, uh, genuine or contrived though it may be, that 
attempts to show the reality of investigating haunted spaces or trying to document the existence of paranormal phenomenon. I find this particular sub variety to be both aggravating and fun, sometimes in like equal measure, and we'll go into depths on that subject at a later point. Finally, there's kind of a strange new iteration. It's kind of a meta variety, a, a sort of philosophically postmodern examination or commentary. This sub subgenre is sometimes called analog given that it uses or emulates pre-digital media, and those elements are used, therefore, to scare or create atmosphere. And Joe, I can already tell that this is clear as mud. Are you referring to analog horror and its use of analog filmmaking stock? Uh, I am, amongst many other things, and that's going to be the subject of the final episode of this series. I'm going to try to disentangle the mess that is analog horror. I am genuinely surprised by it. I think it's cool. We get to talk about skin don't oh we? Oh my God, you have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> but more specifically, I mean that the, the clear as mud thing, like I admit this is a lot of, of heady nonsense and I'm kind of cramming together a bunch of ideas and just sort of throwing them at the audience. You know, over the next like handful of episodes, I want to examine all of these ideas in some detail, attempting to like, lay out a bunch of different films, give like a compare contrast situation with the others and just talk about how these films work kind of broadly. But for tonight's episode, we're just going to focus on the first type, the original found footage type of horror. And by the way, did you actually watch Skinnamarink? Twice. Isn't that movie just bafflingly scary? I wasn't terrified by it. Yeah. I was waiting to be terrified by it. I was expecting it to be a new house okay okay which talk about a fever dream of a film oh that God, we should a, talk about very soon i want to talk about that but i just haven't figured out how yet but yeah agreed it was analog horror taken to the feature film length oh yeah yeah absolutely. i think analog horror and i guess this is a spoiler for a later episode is best consumed in tiny bits mm-hmm because it is banking on the fact that you have watched a home movie more than once in your life, mm. or you have been that kid that just got your tape player for the first time. <laughs> My little cousin, he's, he's about to become this child where you mean I can hit the button and I can make a sound and I can listen to that sound back. Well, what happens if I start recording other sounds like he's on the train? Yeah, that's something that I think analog horror expects from you. Found footage is a different beast. It expects you to have found and decided to watch a random piece of film or digital recording, I guess, goes this direction, too. Yeah. This random thing somebody recorded and decided to post on the Internet. Part of the scary is that you have done that yourself. You know, I don't want to delve too deep into Skinnamarink before we actually record uh, the episode that will include commentary on Skinnamarink. But one thing that I will say about that movie right up top, and uh, you know, feel free to agree or disagree, but about halfway through, I realized this movie is going to be as divisive as Eraserhead used to be. I look forward to that upcoming episode. Yeah, that's going to be a fun one. And if you are not subscribed to The Fright Lab, now is a good time. TheFrightLabPodcast.com. It'll get you there. Yeah. So, for a lot of film-going audience, that, that transition sucks. No, 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 no. <laughs> right. For a lot of film-going audiences, The Blair Witch Project is the progenitor of the entire found footage style. And this isn't surprising, considering how incredibly impactful that movie ended up being. And we'll get to it in a minute, but let's be honest. I just set this one up mostly just so I could knock it down. The Blair Witch Project is not the first found footage film. Absolutely not. Yeah, not even close. I think you can point to three films as the beginning of the movement, really. Cannibal Holocaust, The McPherson Tape, and The Last Broadcast. You may have heard of these movies before, but it wouldn't surprise me if you hadn't. These aren't exactly blockbusters, but we're going to quickly talk about them and how they contain the kind of uh, proto-DNA of the entire horror cinema verite thing. Why isn't Texas Chainsaw Massacre on that list? Let me get to that after I make my argument, but I'm glad you asked that question because that's something I've thought about for a long time, actually. Um, the first and decidedly most infamous 
is Cannibal Holocaust, 1980. Here's like the basic plot as, well, as much as we can say. Uh, a documentary film crew disappears in the Amazon. Sometime later, uh, their remains are found along with their cameras. And when the film is finally reviewed, it's discovered how completely unhinged the crew and their circumstances became. So with that out of the way, I'm just going to issue a blanket warning about this movie. Cannibal Holocaust is a movie I categorically cannot recommend that anyone watch. It's an easy find. It's on a bunch of streaming services. And I can tell you that very, very few films offend me. But this one just disgusts me. The film depicts some pretty reprehensible acts of sexual violence and racism, not to mention multiple acts of real, authentic violence against innocent animals. Uh, I've seen this movie exactly once, and I absolutely refuse to watch it again. Uh, a YouTuber who I follow called Mr. Gigi recently covered the movie on his channel. He did a really good job of breaking it down. Uh, also, a uh, horror author and commentator May Litz on her YouTube channel, Nick Spheres, has covered this movie on multiple occasions. Uh, she actually does a pretty neat breakdown in a couple of videos explaining that there's actually some weird political stuff that happened with it, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, I'll share a link to Mr. Gigi's video, and if you really are interested, uh, Nick Spheres on YouTube, you'll find other commentaries there. If you are really, really curious about Cannibal Holocaust and God, why would you be? Uh, Shudder has a documentary series called Cursed Films. Uh, they have an episode dedicated to Cannibal Holocaust, and it is worth seeing. So for as reprehensible as I find Cannibal Holocaust, there is some interesting history to it. Uh, for instance, the director, Ruggiero Deodato, had the entire cast sign basically non-disclosure agreements and uh, to agree to not appear in a, any new movies for a year. Well, this came back to bite Deodato hard. Uh, so the story goes, he was taken to court after the film's release and accused of murdering his cast. A good many people watched this movie and, and thought it was a snuff film. Now, I've heard this story disputed, but it is like the most common story about it. And if that turned out to be true, it wouldn't surprise me. I'm going to stick with it and say I think it happened, even though I have no clue. That's bad journalism on my behalf, but so it goes. This film was revolutionary for the time period because, you know, again, people thought it was a snuff film, which, you know, kind of a brutal sort of revolutionary thing to do. You know, it, Cannibal Holocaust has like this interesting backstory and uh, some politics behind it, like I said. So it's worth learning about, but I just can't tell you to watch it. Not in good conscience anyway. Okay, so nine years later, there's a movie called The McPherson Tape. Uh, simple premise. Uh, the film's pretty straightforward. A family is recording a child's birthday party on their brand new home video uh, camera device when a number of strange events begin to unfold out in the woods outside their home. Uh, the movie is set in 1983, and boy, howdy, it looks the part. Uh, it was made on a fraction of a shoestring budget, so you kind of have to set your expectations accordingly. It's not a particularly pleasurable film to watch in that regard. And if you're really a fan of the whole found footage thing, it's absolutely worth seeing the like primeval sort of vision of what the style would become. Finally, there is The Last Broadcast, uh, released in 1998. The Last Broadcast sort of fills in the final bits of like the pop cultural view of found footage. This one is interesting as that it brings into play the early internet, which we just discussed in the last episode. The script focuses on a group of uh, paranormal show hosts doing a like internet-based simulcast of their hunt or the Jersey Devil, which is like a cryptid from New Jersey. That's kind of all I can say. Uh, and they go to the Pine Barrens of New Jersey to film it. As you might imagine, things go awry. There is insanity of foot. I have kind of a soft spot for the last broadcast, really. It's a really fun concept. And OK, yeah, the execution of the film is a little uneven, but it's maybe the best of these early three. If you're going to watch one of them, go watch the last broadcast. All of these movies basically lead to like the most powerful currents of the horror cinema verite concept. Cannibal Holocaust focuses on a documentary turning sinister. Therefore, it's kind of an early proto mockumentary. 
The McPherson tape is a primordial found footage, literally being filmed on a home video camera depicting scary stuff. And finally, the last broadcast shows us the earliest sort of paranormal and ghost hunter concepts going into dark territory. A uh, quick aside, there is an outing in this area that predates the last broadcast called Ghost Watch. Um, I'm going to talk about it in another episode later on. Uh, it came out in 1992. I don't include it here primarily because it's not technically speaking a film. It was released uh, on BBC TV, so it's sort of outside of our most strict conversation to be had in this episode. Um, when we bring up the ghost hunting episode, we are going to talk about Ghost Watch. And yeah, you might be able to describe something like uh, The Legend of Boggy Creek as like an early forebearer of the whole genre, but I just don't think that counts in terms of impact or style. It's honestly a pretty weak film and it, it isn't really even believable in any way. So yeah, we'll get to that later. I think that's more of an example of primetime television. And I know 1992 BBC primetime may not have been the word, but that after seven or that after 8 p.m. show that's kind of real, it's sold as real, just dipping their toe into something more scripted and not telling the audience because Halloween, right? Boo. The X-Files did that with cops back in the 90s, if you remember. Mm -hmm. And that was entertaining because you spent the whole time asking yourself, okay, so is this an episode of X-Files or an episode of Cops? <laughs> Which leads me down the path of, so Cops really is just a fake, not real cop show. Which brings us to the penultimate lesson about all of television that I think Betty White said it best. There's no such thing as reality television. Does it have a producer? Does it have a director? Case closed. Uh, you know, Ghost Watch is kind of a weird one, and it's I, I don't want to delve. It's too... more like War of the Worlds, and we're going to get into that in a later episode. Yeah, yeah, it's something we're going to talk about at it's length. It's not like they were pretending to be fake; they just didn't say it was a it was well, a scary uh, show. Well, again, it's it's deeper than that. There's kind of the the pop culture version of the story that says that it's not entirely true. But I get why people would think that. Again, we'll talk about Ghost Watch at a later date and time. But I will say, and I I, I hope the audience does this. Go find a copy of Ghost Watch. It's on YouTube. It's on Tubi. I think I've seen it in a couple other places. It's 90 minutes of good fun. It's very entertaining. It's very well done. So, you know, with that out of the way, it brings us to the real heavy hitters of the first generation of horror cinema verite, the Blair Witch Project and Paranormal Activity. I am willing to wager that most of this podcast's audience has seen these two movies, and there's a non-zero chance that the parents and families of this podcast's audience has seen at least one of these two films. So we're going to keep the plot summary down to a minimum. Uh, they're kind of mimetic in their own way now. Most people kind of get it. So uh, the Blair Witch Project follows three film students into the forests of Maryland as they film a documentary about a local legend. Things quickly go awry, as they often do, and you get a front row seat. Paranormal Activity is the final record of a young couple who have been experiencing strange interruptions in their daily lives, leading to their apparent demise. Again, we get to watch in detail as they are falling apart and finally broken by these experiences. So, why are these two movies so effective? Uh, well, that's kind of a complicated question, actually. Uh, Blair Witch and Paranormal Activity are both chilling and brilliantly use practical effects and feel uh, mostly natural in the limited cast's acting. I personally think that Blair Witch is a better executed film, all things considered, you know, both in terms of like presentation and impact. But I also think that Paranormal Activity, which came out eight years later, I think, ended up being a little more important in some regards. So on the Blair Witch side, the film's cast is less developed and focused on more on the film they're creating than giving you character exposition. Typically, uh, they lack that character development. That's typically like a weakness, but here it allows the audience to use them as a proxy for their own experience in the same way that you might rely on a first-person shooter video games protagonist, right? Moreover, Blair Witch doesn't really need that many special effects. 
The woods at night are often scary enough without a supernatural entity hunting you in it. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, like, I'm a hiker. You know, I think I've said that before. I enjoy hiking. I am always amazed at how sometimes you'll be walking along, you'll be having a great hike, and you stop and go, oh, hell, I'm being watched. And you don't know why you feel that way. It's probably nothing most of the time. That's during daylight hours. Hiking at night is a different animal altogether. So, right. Um, I don't know if this was a, an improv thing, but there's a line in the film's climax that I just, man, I just love. Um, the actress Heather Donahue may or may or may not have scripted it. Uh, Joe, I want you to read this line, and I think it's just it's just brilliant. If you would. Uh, grab that for us if you insist i'm not gonna do the voice i appreciate that <laughs> i was very naive i am so so sorry for everything that has happened because in spite of what mike says now it is my fault because it was my project and i insisted i insisted on everything i insisted that we weren't lost i insisted that we keep going I insisted that we walk south. Everything had to be my way. And this is where we've ended up. And it's all because of me that we're here now. Hungry, cold, and hunted. Right? For me, the phrase hungry, cold, and hunted explains what horror cinema verite does best. When properly done, this style of filmmaking should make you feel unsettled on a visceral level. Horror is a great way to safely experience being unsafe, and this is one of the best ways to get there. Moreover, we have to remember that Blair Witch really was more than just a movie. There was a massive, brilliantly executed ad campaign involving a fledgling public access that most people first had to the internet. The film was marketed as a real piece of film, as a real documentary, and was never implied with any of the ad campaign to be fictional. Fuck, man, it, it, I don't know if most people know this, but it had its own mockumentary made, The Curse of the Blair Witch, to add to its realism. Ultimately, The Blair Witch Project is a success that few other films, irrespective of genre, that few other films can touch. To wit, the budget for this movie was $750,000. It grossed in theaters over $248 million, and that says nothing of home video. Blair Witch is now legendary, both loved and reviled, but absolutely an important part of modern film history. You told me to wait until you made your argument, but that sounds eerily familiar to the marketing campaign of Texas Chainsaw. Okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to my point about paranormal activity, and then I'll get to the, the Texas Chainsaw bit. So, what about paranormal activity, right? That's the other one. I mostly enjoy this movie, but I have to confess that I have some pretty heavy criticisms of it. Uh, our protagonists, Katie and uh, Mika, I believe, are honestly a little hard to relate to, especially Mika. Horror cinema verite characters can sometimes be a little hard to grasp onto, but Mika feels like an absolute jackass never seen before in this century. It's more than this like proto tech bro crypto investor character that he seems to have, or that he seems to have only learned about things like Ouija boards and demons in like the last six weeks. He tries to be like the proverbial big man, but just comes off as a buffoon. Formally, I have to announce. I am a member of the fraternal order of fuck Mika. <laughs> Jokes aside, uh, the actor Mika Sloat actually does an excellent job in playing this sort of like unlikable prick of a character. And he's a great foil for Katie Featherston. Uh, between the two of them, the other minor cast members and uh, director Oren Pelly's work really make a startlingly effective movie. Some of the scares are, in fact, genuinely scary. Uh, the special effects are brilliantly done and they feel pretty real. And the audience agreed. With a roughly $230,000 budget, it brought in $193 million. 
The ad campaign, which uh, uses this like grainy green night vision footage, uh, just covers a theatrical audience reacting in terror. And it does a lot with very little. If you've never seen those ads, go look them up on YouTube. They're great. And it seems to have like continued the work of Blair Witch, drawing in more and more mainstream audiences. I think that everything from the acting style to the look of this movie left its fingerprints all over this kind of approach. So real quick, uh, Joe brought up the idea that Texas Chainsaw, why does this not count? The only reason I say it doesn't count has nothing to do with the plot, it has to do with the way it's filmed. At no point is the conceit of the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre that the, uh, the teenagers who are in the van, who are about to get the shit killed out of them, are filming this like the, none of them have a camera none of them are documenting this whole ordeal they're just out there and they're about to get screwed like that's really just about it now i will say that i think toby hooper was absolutely brilliant in the way he shot the film because it does feel kind of like you're watching like footage from vietnam it gives you that same kind of gross feeling because it feels very real the lighting is very natural the the acting is so wild and over the top and insane. It feels a little too over the top and insane that somehow becomes more real. Um, it is close to proto horror cinema verite. And I think if you were to compare it to just cinema verite, like the original uh, French filmic idea, I think it actually might actually count. Part of the reason it was sold that way was because of how it was filmed. It was a very raw film at a time when you were about to get a lot more raw B-movie exploitative cinema when what did we have up until that point? You basically had all the Western films. You had all of the classic black and white films. And those were filmed more like a stage play that's being experienced. There's value there. But now, here's somebody who takes what appears to be a less sophisticated camera and a less sophisticated crew and tries to create or capture something raw because no one had ever seen something like that before. You know, it's, it's interesting when you watch a movie like Texas Chainsaw and you remember that it happened basically at the same time as Argento Suspiria, right? Because there's a certain level of uh, aesthetic maximalism that both of those films really go for that I don't think you see in other movies. There's nothing minimal about Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It is just bludgeoning you with everything that happens. Even the most sedate of scenes in it feel like they're kicking you in the teeth. But it's weird when you take a movie like uh, Suspiria, which is so stylized and so beautiful and like Turn off the audio and just watch it. It's mesmerizing. Absolutely. I don't know what the opposite of mesmerizing is in this concept or in this context, but Texas Chainsaw Massacre is the opposite of giallo mesmerism. It's more about just just smashing you from the beginning to the end. And, you know, uh, spoilers for the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, a sentence <laughs> I never thought I'd have to say. The opening kill of that film, the guy just getting clocked in the face with a hammer, that still makes me wince because if you've ever whacked your thumb with a hammer or ever been hit with like a, a pop fly baseball, you know how blunt impact feels. It doesn't hurt right away, but you know it's coming and, and you're just waiting for it to come. And then you see him get whacked with the hammer and you go, yeah, that, that's that's how that look. You, you would be unconscious before you hit the ground and maybe even dead before you hit the ground. It's so grim because it feels so real uh, i heard that i think i've said this before in the show i heard someone make the comment about texas chainsaw that we've seen plenty of movies that were about psychopaths but texas chainsaw was the first movie that looks like it was filmed by a psychopath and i think that's true i i i think texas chainsaw feels real in a way that many found footage movies doesn't or can't but is it found footage? Is it horror cinema verite? Uh, I kind of have to bulk just on some technical levels. But so, okay, if Texas Chainsaw is not, what is, right? Well, of course, there's the uh, Spanish language nightmare that is Wreck, which is, uh, I believe, Catalan. No, it's not Catalan. 
but it's from Spain. Uh, it follows a TV crew into an apartment building that's dealing with this dark, evil infestation. Or you could go from Japan with Noroi the Curse, a Japanese Shinto folk horror documentary thing. And it, it it's, for my dollar, one of the best of the early J-horror explosion. And of course, everyone wants to bring up the Poughkeepsie tapes, which... I genuinely hate that movie, but people seem to love it. Uh, it follows a serial killer around kind of halfway between the Blair Witch Project and the Silence of the Lambs. Uh, it was supposed to go th out through MGM. Uh, it lost distribution rights for some reason. I don't know the full story off the top of my head. And it bounces around from streaming services uh, every so often. Finally, it appears to have gotten the DVD release at one point. I, again, I didn't follow it. Uh, fans of the more extreme sides of horror and of found footage, uh, they seem to swear by it. So, you know, if you want your uh, found footage a little grosser, uh, yeah, check it out. It could be in your bag. Can we talk about the effectiveness of found footage movies as horror cinema? There are so many films, and I think that we're still feeling the pain of this, that of course, the Blair Witch Project is the standout example in the last 30 years of how to make a movie very cheap that doesn't take a lot of time. And yes, time is part of the budget in the grand equation that can make so much money. Somewhere at the top, there's somebody who says, well, look, let's just make more movies like that. And that's how you get paranormal activity. That's how you get, is it the pandemic films? Um, there's so many found footage movies that I personally have begun to ignore them. I think every film that has tried to shove the shaky cam down our throat has pulled something from found footage horror. And that is a trend that needs to die. Is a film like Blair Witch effective? Or is it just a standout example of someone made all the right decisions? Because even the plot of that film and how it ends is something that is still being interpreted by many people incorrectly, in my opinion. I'm going to sound audacious making this comparison, but I think it's a comparison worth making. Are we still talking about the MGM classic uh, or I'm sorry not MGM, Christ, uh, the Universal Monsters, Dracula and the Mummy and the Frankenstein because they're great movies. I think, like, okay, yeah, I'm more of a guy, I'm more of a fan of the Mummy than I am of the original Dracula film. Fair enough. But I think we talk about those movies because they are on some level still really effective films. Like, they're, they're still good movies. Um, I recently went and saw... Uh, uh, Hitchcock Psycho in a theater with a bunch of people who'd never seen it before. Did you see it from the beginning? Yeah, yeah. We just uh, checking. <laughs> yeah, of, of course. We we caught Psycho uh, at at a local uh, college who was doing a live showing of it, and it was it's so interesting watching people who have never seen that movie walk into it kind of blind because it's such a different movie. Like it is undeniably a great film. It is a, a fantastic movie in virtually every regard. And we talk about Psycho because it is that good. Is Blair Witch objectively as good as Psycho or Dracula? Uh, I don't know. I don't know that that's a conversation you can really have. I think taste is ultimately subjective, right? But I think you can watch a movie like Blair Witch and see why it was so effective. Because at that time, no one had seen Cannibal Holocaust. No one had seen the McPherson tape. No one had seen the last broadcast. They're, they're very much niche things that had to be found later on, right? Uh, or had to be rediscovered, maybe, is a better way of looking at it. I do think, though, that The Blair Witch as a, as a horror movie is still effective. Now, going back and re-watching it in the last uh, couple of months, having not seen it since, I don't know, early 2000s, like I'd seen it a handful of times, just never went back and rewatched it. I think re-watching it was really eye-opening because there's a couple of scenes in the movie that just made my skin crawl. Like, it just still, damn, that was good acting. Damn, that was good direction. That was super effective. But I can't make that same claim about every found footage horror movie. I periodically will go online and find a found footage horror movie and watch it. And about 90% of the time, it's not good. Like, 
And I don't, and again, I never want to take anything away from filmmakers because I have an idea of how hard it is to make a film. I know it's hell. I know it's not something you do accidentally. It's something you do because you love it or you're making a lot of money because making a film fucking sucks from what I understand. Quarantine was the film I was trying to uh, reference oh, earlier when I said pandemic. Okay, so quarantine's kind of an interesting one, right? Uh, so for the for the audience who may not know, uh, Wreck, the Spanish language film I was talking about, is a genuinely good found footage movie. It's really freaky. It's a lot of fun. Quarantine happened at that time when a lot of studios didn't trust their audience to read subtitles. So they bought the rights to Wreck to remake it, and they made a basically shot-for-shot -shot remake set in America with an English-language cast called Quarantine. I don't want to take anything away from that movie because the actors were very physical, and there's a lot of stuff about it that's like, wow, they really they went hard with that one. That was pretty impressive. But it's not great. Like, if you've seen Wreck, you genuinely just don't need to see Quarantine because it's not... Yeah, I... I Again, I don't want to take anything away from that crew or that cast, but yeah, it's it's not great, especially if you've seen uh if you've seen the original wreck. I think found footage fails when you start to sequelize it. Well, I think most films start to fail when you sequelize them, right? Like listen, you can I certainly go too far, but it's okay to add pieces to a story as long as you have an end goal in mind well i think saw started as something with an end goal that just got added on added <laughs> on added sure. on to the point where you can't even shut the door on your own story without really going to the well it's a dead horse of a movie it really that, is that's and, the perfect and, way to say that and it's one of those things for me where uh, most of the time sequels don't add anything to the original or don't take the story in a new direction like no one wants to see suspiria 2 no one minds inferno but no one wants to see suspiria 2 even though inferno is sort of kind of a sequel it's not it is, but it's not really at the same time. I, I think there's an argument to be made that like if you're intend like if you as a writer and a director say, I want to make three movies all featuring the same characters in a in a progressive storyline, I don't I don't know that I see a problem with that. I think that can be done tastefully and artfully. But how many fucking John Wick movies do we need? I mean, just honestly, how many <laughs> The answer was one. And uh, fuck, man, they just kept making them. How many Hellraiser movies did we need? Two. Two. And they just kept making them. And I don't understand why. Like, look, man, I like Pinhead. I'm a fan. I am a fan of the man. But holy crap, those those later sequels are rough. And I, I get it. A lot of production houses, a lot of studios are concerned with the bottom dollar. It's an industry, brutal as that is, it's an industry and they intend on making returns on their investment. Well, the problem is, I don't know that art is ever a great investment. And I'm gonna go on a limb and say that the Blair Witch Project is art. And I think- It absolutely uh, is. You know, there's a sequel to the Blair Witch Project that's not even found footage. And while I think it's not great, I don't particularly enjoy that film on any level, I kind of have to give them a lot of credit for not trying to replicate the Blair Witch again. It's you know? a film that, and there's a piece of found footage in it that's part of the plot that right. I'm not going to spoil for a movie that came out over 20 years ago, but <laughs> you could have called it something else. And I probably would look back on it more fondly than I do calling it Blair Witch 2. But the Blair Witch Project really is a unique player in not just the genre, but in film in general. The Blair Witch Project is, is kind of a golden egg, if you think about it, because it's a film that was made for very cheap, that made a lot of money because it had the right marketing campaign Somebody at the top decided to just copy the fuck out of it. And most people didn't even get what was going on in the plot. Yeah. Have you read any interviews or interactions with the director where he just flat out explains the ending? Um, I've never really bothered with that because uh, at the risk of sounding like a, a film purist jerk off, I, I kind of am a death of the author guy. I kind of think... Once a piece of art's out in public, you kind of no longer control the narrative anymore. 
but I, I have followed a little bit of his commentary kind of in the years subsequent. Um, there was a documentary that Shudder, re- I don't know if they produced it, but I know they released it, uh, the found footage phenomenon or something. Uh, it's really good. It's it's long. It's kind of a longish watch, but it's it's really well done, and it does kind of dig into Hex and Films, who only ended up doing the Blair Witch Project. I bring it up because it's not so much him controlling the narrative. It's him acknowledging that he clearly didn't put the narrative on screen effectively (laughs) enough for everybody to get it. Right. Because when someone tells you that the whole film is two characters taking someone into the middle of the woods to kill them, the entire scope of the film and everything scary about it that you're talking about, some of the really effective direction becomes even more valuable as a film and more effective as a film because what I don't know and I'm sure he explained it I can't remember is the cast didn't always know oh yeah yeah what he was getting at I I know that there was a lot of production decisions made uh about the cast had an idea it's, it's kind of like um Telling uh, them what they need to know to get through the day. Yeah, it's like coherence. They gave them a rough bit of, you need to do X, Y, and Z, but otherwise it's kind of up to you. You're going to figure this out. Uh, I know that there was a lot of that. They kind of didn't tell them, like, yeah, while you're in the, uh, while you're doing the sequence of, of of chatting in the tent, we're going to come and scare the fuck out of you. Uh, and so a lot of their terrified reactions, because they're pretty good actors, all things considered, uh, a, a lot of their reactions are fairly authentic. They were very much taken by surprise in a lot of those scenes. Now, I've never read anything about the ending being about, no, really, it was just two people killing a third. Maybe that's the case. I've never read it that way because I don't think any of the uh, diegetic action of the film shows us any of that, really. If I can pique your interest, which is hard to do. I've known you for a long time. <laughs> why would Josh run down the stairs saying where he was and where he was going when she was so far behind him. Well, okay, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, again, having recent, rather recently watched the film, um, so one character goes missing and presumably gets his eye and his tongue torn out, which was, you know, kind of gnarly. Uh, then the next guy runs out and then Heather runs out and Josh ends up at the end of the film facing the wall like it's mentioned in the beginning of the movie that the the murderer would make the kids face the wall so that he didn't have to look at them while he was bashing their brains in um my under my read of the film has always been uh first dude is dead the second guy is about to be dead and heather gets clobbered on her way down the stairs i never could commit to that but i was hmm. always looking for justification for it like clearly The story is Mike has been captured, killed, tortured. But think back in the film. Who throws away the map? Mike does. He even says I did it. Hmm. So this whole time, tension is rising. They keep being lost, right? Does it make... if If we're going with the found footage perspective here, does it make more sense to say, and there are reasons that... I encourage you and our listeners to look into from the director's perspective where the plot was for Mike and Josh to take her in the woods and kill her. And Mike goes missing because he's the one making all the noises and trying to creep the two of them out and being led to that house in the middle of the woods that really may not have been that far from where they came in. Basically, Josh's job was to lead her upstairs, lead her downstairs, and then she's so freaked out. Apparently, that's what happened. This was a plot for two guys to just take her in the woods and kill her, Um, which if it's the way the director wanted it to be, I agree. It's not clearly explained on screen. So now we get to play that game of I'm the audience. I'm interpreting the film this way. And the fact that the director even says, if you see it that way, that's fine. That means I messed up. But let me tell you what I was going for. (laughs) You do realize that we're going to have to cut this entire thing out because of our commitment to non-spoilers. It's a film that came out 25 years ago. Can we make an exception? I'll let it pass. (laughs) Yes. 
so I, as our banter can can illustrate, I think, to the audience, you know, there is an element of this where uh, even if you assume that Blair Witch was not well described uh, on screen, so to speak, there is a level of it that is still open to interpretation. And here we are, a film that came out in 1999. It is 2023, my man. We are still talking about this movie and still sussing out the details of it. You know, with all of that said, right, it's worth noting that we've kind of only like scratched the surface of the quote unquote pure found footage horror thing. There's plenty of movies using this rough formula, so you can make a good exploration of it uh, a thing if that's the point you want to make. And I'm willing to wager that our audience, being good horror hounds, have a few favorites already in mind, which makes me want to ask, what do you think? Are there other important films in this, like, subgenre of sorts? And what found footage joint should Joe and I check out next? You need to let us know by emailing us at thefrightlabpodcast at gmail.com. You can find us on the flaming wreckage of Twitter under fright underscore lab underscore pod. We're also on Letterboxd under the name Fright Lab Pod. And that's where we post uh, small reviews and sneak peeks of what we've been working on or watching in our spare time. Joe, I know that you're a fairly prolific podcaster. Would you kindly let our audience know where else they can find your work? If you are a fan of all things heavy metal, you need to listen to all the podcasts we are creating at DiscussMetal.com. We talk about your favorite bands, my favorite bands. We talk about heavy metal topics. If you're a fan of nerdy subjects, you need to check out the Nerf Herder Council. Those guys are talking about everything from Star Wars to Star Trek. I realize that's not a big jump, but go with me on this. <laughs> they span the gamut. I've been hanging out with AJ. We're talking about Star Trek. That is the Trek AF podcast. But what I really want you to do now is take your phone out. If this is the first time you've listened to The Fright Lab, or if you've been here since the very beginning, we appreciate you. Scroll down, scroll left, scroll right, however your particular platform decides this is necessary. And find the place where you can give us a thumbs up, where you can give us a five-star review. We want to hear from you. We want to know what you think about The Fright Lab and all these topics that we're talking about. You heard Lucas say it, The Fright Lab Podcast at gmail.com. Lucas, please tell the wonderful gruesome audience how much we love independent artists and independent media i want this to be the last thing you hear before my brains are bashed out in the basement uh, in the woods of burkittsville maryland you're going to see me bent over a camera crying and blowing snot bubbles all over it as i say you know podcasting can be kind of thankless sometimes it can feel like no one's listening despite what you know is actually happening but i'll tell you that we are in a golden age for horror media kind of broadly and for horror media podcasts. I am just so thrilled to see new stuff every day and to hear new concepts and ideas being discussed. Indie media is valuable and important in a way that you can't get your head around. And if you want to get somewhere in one piece, you need to go with your team. And we're trying to assemble that team. We're trying to bring as many people together to talk about this as possible. If you have some horror adjacent project, be that a podcast, be that some dark ambient music like you hear us playing in the show, be it a heavy metal band or a punk band doing some horror thing. If it is tangentially horror, we want to hear about it and we want to plug it on our show. As always, you can reach us at the Fright Lab Podcast gmail.com to tell us about what you're working on and whether or not we can share it with the world. And as always, the Fright Lab is written and researched by me, Lucas Yoakum. The production and co-hosting is handled by the man who records everything, Mr. Joseph Wren. Stay tuned for our next episode on this subject coming soon. We appreciate you all. Thank you and have a good night.